If you're excited for Moana 2 and are hoping to enjoy it in theaters this Thanksgiving, I would honestly recommend you not watch this episode because I'm going to change the way that you see Maui, Te Fiti, Te Ka, and even Moana herself forever. It's no secret that the events of the first Moana film were directly inspired by Polynesian mythology, but what a lot of people don't realize is how dark and disturbing those original myths actually are. From the creative ways that Maui deceived and defeated the ancient gods, to how those gods punished Maui when they finally had enough of his shenanigans. Now, in my opinion, knowing these stories makes the movie even better because it basically allows you to watch it through the eyes of an ancient Polynesian, minus the lived experience and badass tattoos. But to this day, I still get comments accusing me of destroying childhoods everywhere. I think that's understandable considering that Maui's life story has more in common with the movie Teeth than anyone would have expected, but in the end, it's up to you to make peace with this information. With a teaser like that, we just gotta get into it, right? First though, I want you to know that Disney's Maui did not do all of these favors for humans out of the kindness of his heart. In reality, he was trying to fill the empty void that was created in his soul when his parents abandoned him. As we saw though, that just got him in more trouble, and what ultimately worked in the end was talking through his problems with someone he trusted and formulating a plan to move forward. Everyone needs help like this from time to time, and having a safe space to express your feelings can help you process troubling emotions and experiences that have always lingered in the back of your mind. Which is why I want to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make that safe space accessible to everyone through therapy. And they know how hard it is for some people, like myself, to even take that first step. So they've designed a seamless sign-up experience. All you have to do is fill out a short questionnaire on their website and they'll match you with a therapist in as little as a couple of days. These trained mental health professionals are there to lead you down the path of self-understanding, to give you coping strategies for dealing with trauma, along with honing your skills for settling conflict. Whether you need someone to set goals for you and keep you accountable, or just be the person you vent your frustrations to, they can handle it. But say you're matched with a therapist who's not a good fit it's no big deal. BetterHelp can easily find you a new therapist, and they'll do it as many times as it takes for you to find someone you really connect with. Even better, you can choose how to connect with them, whether it's video chatting, phone calls, or even texting. If you think you could benefit from therapy, click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com john to get 10% off your first month. The myths that we're covering today have all been sourced from Polynesian mythology. But what exactly is Polynesian mythology? To give you an overly simplified explanation, the Polynesian mythos is made of stories that have been collected from New Zealand and a number of Pacific islands, like Tonga, Samoa, Hawaii, Easter Island, and a bunch more that I'll embarrass myself trying to pronounce. The reason I'm telling you this is because many of these countries have their own distinct versions of each myth, and a lot of the time, the islands that make up those countries have their own versions too. Today, we're mostly focusing on the Hawaiian and Maori traditions because those had the heaviest influence on the movie, but if you've heard a different version, I would love to read about it in the comments. Also, for those who don't know, the Maori are the indigenous peoples that hail from New Zealand and I want to apologize in advance for pronouncing it as Maori in the next section. When that was recorded, it was my first foray into Polynesian myth and I had a lot to learn still do. Since then, I've been told by a bunch of TikTok commenters that even my corrected pronunciation of Maori is wrong because I guess natives roll their R's when they say it. I believe that sounds like Maori, but I'm from the Midwest, dude. The only time that we roll our R's is when we're freezing. So when it comes to Maui, there's actually a lot of things that Disney got right, but also a lot they got wrong about the demigod's role in Polynesian mythology. At first glance, the most notable inaccuracy is Maui's appearance. If you've only seen the movie, you'll probably be surprised to hear this, but Maui has traditionally been portrayed as a handsome young man, usually a teenager, with a top knot. Sometimes he even has six-pack abs. In fact, this version of him is so common that when Maui's character was first revealed for the movie, it was very shocking to the Polynesian community, and some even took offense 
because Polynesians being overweight is a common negative stereotype. I'm here to let you know though, this was completely unintentional by the movie's directors and writers, John Musker and Ron Clements, who by the way, directed a ton of your favorite Disney films, Little Mermaid, Hercules, Princess and the Frog, and Aladdin to name a few. Throughout Moana's production, they consulted with the Oceanic Story Trust, a team of experts from across the South Pacific that specialized in fishing techniques, tattoos, ancient navigation, traditional dance, pretty much all aspects of Polynesian culture. For example, for many of the nine major evolutions the movie went through, yes, nine, Maui was going to be bald and a little scarier looking. But when a group from Tahiti said he had to have long flowing hair because it was the source of his mana, Maui was redesigned. The same thing basically happened with Maui's size. He started out small, but the Oceanic Story Trust insisted that he had to be a larger than life character like Superman, and he continued to grow bigger as time went on. Now, when it comes to Maui's temperament and personality, Disney did a little better with this one because Maui really was a trickster and would often cause mischief that somehow had beneficial consequences for humans, intentional or not. That being said, they did make some changes to his backstory for the sake of the movie's plot and the children's innocence. See, in Moana, he was born to mortal parents and they abandoned him when he was just a baby by throwing him into the ocean. But then the gods took pity on him, so they made him a demigod and gave him a magic fish hook that allowed him to shapeshift. This story was inspired by the Maori tradition. Maui's mother, Taranga, was human and his father, Makia Tutara, was a guardian of the underworld. You see, Maui was born prematurely and his parents expected him to die, so his mom wrapped him up in a bundle of her own hair and threw him into the ocean. Then, similar to how Moana was greeted by the ocean spirits when she was a baby, Maui was saved by them. The spirits wrap him in seaweed, he's taken care of by some sea creatures, and then when a storm comes, he's returned to land where he's raised by his divine ancestor, Tama Nui Te Ra, the personification of the sun. He does eventually reunite with his mother though, where he also meets his three brothers and sister, and many adventures ensue. Make no mistake though, just because Maui was born a demigod doesn't mean he was worshipped. In fact, he even says as much in the You're Welcome song, there's no need to pray, it's okay, you're welcome. Instead, he was just revered for his abilities and also considered a hero to humanity. As for his magic fish hook, that he really did get from the gods. Only in Maori tradition, the fish hook is made of the jawbone of his godly ancestor, and the deity who gifted it was Murray Ranga Wanua, which could be either his grandmother or grandfather, depending on the version. But in the timeline where it's his grandfather, he doesn't just receive the fish hook as a gift, Nah, instead he starves poor Gramps to death by hiding his food when he's supposed to be serving it to him, and then he takes the weapon after he's dead. That Maui, always such a trickster, killing his grandpa just so he can rob him. I wonder what kind of hijinks he's going to pull next. Without a doubt, one of my favorite scenes in the Moana film is when Maui performs his signature song, You're Welcome, where he boasts about all of his greatest deeds. Not only is it a catchy friggin' jam, but it's also almost entirely based on real Polynesian myth. Some of the accomplishments that he sings about are, he pulled the islands up from the ocean, he stole fire to keep us warm and safe against predators, he pulled up the sky so humans could walk around freely, harnessed the breeze so we could travel on water, lassoed the sun to lengthen the days, and of course, he buried Anil's guts, which begot us coconut. Quite the resume, huh? And as you're about to see, the stories behind each one are as incredible as you'd imagine. The myth of Maui pulling up the islands is a great one to start with and is also one of my favorites. According to the Maori tradition, Maui's older brothers would always leave him behind on fishing trips. So one day he decided to stow away in their canoe and didn't reveal himself until they were far enough away from land that they couldn't just turn around. Naturally, his older brothers were annoyed with him and still refused to give him bait, so Maui punched himself in the nose, smeared his blood on the magic fish hook, and cast it into the ocean using some enchanted fishing line he made. Soon enough, he felt his hook catch on something big and he told his brothers to paddle the boat as hard as they could. Eventually, the massive fish had surfaced and Maui told his brothers to leave it be while he retrieved a priest to do the proper ritual. Only, of course, his brothers didn't listen and impatiently chopped up the fish for themselves, only for it to turn into an island. According to legend, if the brothers had waited, then the island would have been a flat surface that was much easier to cross, but all of their chopping led to the creation of mountains, valleys, and rivers across New Zealand. As you might expect, there's a Hawaiian version of this myth too, and it's pretty similar. Only in that one, Maui baits the hook with birds that are sacred to his mother instead of his own blood, and he pulls up the islands directly from the ocean floor instead of it ever being a fish. In another crazy myth, Maui wanted to know where fire came from, so one night he went village to village putting out every flame he saw. Then he learned from the village chief, who was actually his mom, that someone would have to ask Mahuika, the goddess of fire, for more. As it turns out, Maui is actually a 
descendant of Mahuika due to her and the grandpa he stole the fish hook from getting busy ages ago, so he volunteered to ask her. He found her living inside a volcano at the end of the earth, and she gave him one of her flaming fingernails to reignite the fires back home. But, Maui being Maui, he extinguished it. Mahuika was like, what the hell man, don't do that again, and gave him another one, but he put that one out too. And so the process continued until the goddess was infuriated in trying to burn Maui alive. The only reason he even escaped was because he transformed into a bird and prayed to the weather gods to rain on her. Mahuika gave one last Hail Mary attempt and threw some fire at Maui when he made it back to his homeland, but she missed and the trees around him went up in flames. Then Maui took the now dried out branches and showed humans how to rub them together to make fire. Now the Hawaiian version of this one is actually way different. Instead of confronting a goddess, Maui simply captures and threatens the leader of a fire making tribe of birds and they tell him about the rubbing sticks together technique. In one of the shorter myths, Maui pulls up the sky. Apparently for a long time, the sky rested on the tops of trees, which pushed them back into the earth and made it harder for humans to walk around. Hence, when Maui sings that line in the song, he says he pulled up the sky when you were waddling yay high. In one version of the Hawaiian myth, Maui simply erects a tall pillar for the sky to rest on, and in another, he just pushed the sky up with his bare hands. What makes that second one really cool though, is that he actually carried the sky to the top of a nearby mountain and then threw it so hard that it hung even higher. Another short one follows Maui as he releases the winds. Basically what happens is he tries to fly a kite just like his tattoo shows many Maui doing, but he can't because the winds are so weak. So he approaches an old priest who is the keeper of the winds and tells him to release them. He ends up losing his kite because he totally underestimates the wind's power, but after traveling 60 miles on foot to get it back, he learns his lesson and then shows humans how to use the wind responsibly. Now this next myth isn't the last one we're talking about, but it's definitely my favorite. The one where Maui, with the help of his brothers, lassos the sun. See, apparently, before he had done that, the sun would either travel across the sky way too quickly or at just random intervals throughout the day, depending on the version. This made it difficult for Maui's mother to hang and dry her laundry. So, being a good son, who had totally gotten over the whole being thrown in the ocean to die thing, he gathered his brothers and traveled east to where the sun rested before rising in the morning. Then, using the net or noose they had made out of their sister's hair, they tied it around the sun, restraining him, and Maui he beat him with his fish hook until he agreed to travel across the sky slower. That's at least the Maori version. In the Hawaiian version, they simply convince the sun to slow down without beating it, or use the lasso on the sun to slow it down as it traveled. And now for Maui's final flex, how he got us coconuts. This one takes place after the majority of Maui's other amazing accomplishments. He returns home from sailing the ocean and fishing up even more islands to discover that humanity is making use out of his good deeds. They're building houses, using fire to cook, the sun was now in the sky for long enough that they could farm and develop routines of their own, and many had settled down and started families. Feeling a little jealous of the humans, Maui decided he wanted to settle down too, so he married a woman named Hina Ate Lapo. I'm just going to call her Hina though, if that's alright with you. The two lived by a river that Hina would often walk to to fetch water, but one day she's assaulted by Tunaroa, which means smooth eel. Depending on the story you read, Tunaroa may either be a hairless warrior chief, a merman, or a literal eel. No matter the one that you prefer though, one thing stayed consistent, he would repeatedly sneak up on Hina and push her into the river with his slimy tail, which infuriated Maui when he found out. There's also a version where Tuna eats Maui's children too, so he had plenty of justification for wanting to kill this guy. Knowing that he would never be able to catch Tuna if he approached him in his own territory, the river, he set a trap for the freak instead. Either building a bridge across the river to lure him to the other side, or attaching a net to it, again, depending on the version. If Maui went the bridge route, he simply chopped off Tuna's head as he tried crossing, but in the net version, he chops the eel up into a bunch of tiny pieces. Both myths end the same way though. Maui pushes the remains of his body into the river where it dissolves into many different kinds of fish, then buries his head from which a coconut tree sprouts. So that is the last of the myths referenced in your welcome but we're not done yet. There is one final myth that we need to discuss because not only is it still one of the strangest that we've ever covered on this show, it also served as the foundation of the movie's plot, although they made it a lot more appropriate for kids. Final warning, this is your last chance to back out before I change the way you see Maui forever. So remember how in the movie, Maui does all of those insane favors for humanity because he was trying to earn back their love from when he was abandoned? And how this ultimately led to him trying to steal the heart of Tefiti so humans can create life, but in the process he was struck down by her alter ego, Teka, and banished to a desolate island with no way of escaping? 
Yeah, you remember that, right? Well, once again, the Polynesian lore has its own version of that story, only it's way weirder and way darker. In it, Maui has accomplished just about everything he ever wanted to do. He made a life for himself and basically set up humanity to have a successful future in all ways but one. For his final trick, Maui wanted to grant immortality to humans, and the way he believed he could do this would be through violating the goddess of night, Hine Nui Te Po, who receives the souls of humans when they die. To do this, Maui transformed himself into a worm and crawled inside Hine, attempting to reverse the birthing process on her. Unfortunately, that is the most explicit I can get because YouTube flagged this compilation the first time I uploaded it for sexually explicit content. They wouldn't tell me what that was, but I have a feeling that was the issue. Anyway, back to Maui. He convinced his four brothers to join him on his search for her, and when they found the goddess sleeping, he turned them all into birds so they could watch from the trees above. He also warned them not to laugh at him while he was working his magic, which I ironically, is a detail I find hilarious. Maui then turned himself into a worm and crawled inside the goddess, and it was all going smoothly until his brothers burst out laughing at the hilarious image, alerting Hine, who proceeded to crush Maui with the obsidian teeth that lined her south entrance. Now there's actually another part of this story I didn't mention last time, and that explains why Maui was destined to be killed. Back in the day when Makia Tutara, Maui's father and the guardian of the underworld, was performing Maui's baptism, he messed up part of the incantation, and as a result, Maui became vulnerable. Maui is also a trickster hero, and Hine, the collector of souls and goddess of death, is referred to as the one being who cannot be tricked. Being that Maui was always upping the ante on his hijinks, it was inevitable that he push it too far and challenge death itself, and as a result, that had to be his end. Well, maybe he didn't have to go out in that specific way, I just meant that she had to be the one to take him out. And as sad and messed up as that is, I've honestly gotta give credit to Disney for finding a way to tell that story to children without scarring them for life. In my opinion, Teika is one of the more unique Disney antagonists because she's not necessarily an evil being that needs to be defeated, but rather a good one that lost something valuable to her and was consumed by darkness. And the same can actually be said about the two goddesses that inspired her creation. Pele, the goddess of fire, volcanoes, and a whole host of other destructive elements, and Hine Noe Te Po, the goddess of night, death, and the underworld. Those are the lovely ladies that we'll be talking about today, so let's just jump into it. If you haven't yet, make sure you drop a like and subscribe, unless you want the guy goddesses of fire and death to unleash the wrath upon you. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but by not liking this video, you're kind of saying you don't like Pele, and as you're about to find out, she does not take too kindly to people disrespecting her like that. The irony is she'd probably be more pissed at me for exploiting her on YouTube for likes, so let me just tell you about her and see if we can get her back on my side. So how do I put this? Pele has the exact kind of personality you would expect the embodiment of fire, lightning, wind, and volcanoes to have. She's a fiery one, you might say. The qualities that she's most known for are her incredible power, passion, jealousy, and volatility. She was the daughter of Kuwaha Ilo, aka Maggot Mouth, the man-devouring god who introduced human sacrifice, and Aumia, an ancient earth deity, or in some stories, the personification of the earth, like Gaia. Haumia's other children, Pele's siblings, are all pretty big deals too. There's Kakawa Kahi, the god of war, the beautiful Hiaka, patron goddess of hula dancers and medicine, and many others that all represent different elements of nature like rain and ocean waves. By the way, I just want to say thank you to the Kiwis who commented corrections for my pronunciations in the last Moana video. Those were, without a doubt, the most polite comments of that kind I've ever gotten. It was just so refreshing to be corrected by someone whose intent was to educate instead of trying to prove how smart they think they are. Now, the kindness that you showed when I was pronouncing Maori as Maori, I'm going to need you to extend that to about 10 more words because we cover a lot of new territory in this episode. For example, when Pele was born, she wasn't a god just yet, but rather a kind of being known as a kupua. Maui also fits into this category, by the way. It's kind of like being a demigod, but not really. Basically, I would compare them to the superhumans in the Marvel Universe. They look like people, they act like people, but they have extraordinary abilities that put them above the rest. Now, due to Pele's fiery and, dare I say, egocentric temperament, she was known for starting drama among her siblings. Her worst offense, though, was against her sister Namaka, goddess of the sea. She banged her husband and didn't even say she was sorry. In some versions of the myth, Pele's father punishes her by sending her away from their home in Tahiti to live elsewhere, but in others, 
Pelly volunteers, either because she's eager to explore or wants to get away from the sister she pissed off. Then she's given a canoe by her brother, Kamahoali'i, the king of sharks, and she sails off, joined by a few of her other brothers. Also traveling with Pele is her favorite little sister, Hiaka, who I mentioned earlier. Only at this point, she's still in egg form, though she will go on to be the first of Pele's family to be born on the Hawaiian Islands. Now, originally, they struck land on the island of Kauai and were planning on establishing themselves there, but they were attacked by Namaka, who just can't seem to get over her sister's betrayal. Well, Pele actually ends up getting her ass kicked and left for dead, but she manages to recover and ends up making her way to Hawaii. Interestingly, though, there's a few other kupuas already living on the island. Weyu, kupua of the underground reservoir, Kahupaokani, kupua of Hawaii's springs, Lili Noe, kupua of the mountain mists, and her older sister Poliahu, kupua of the snow. And there's actually a pretty funny myth about the first time they meet Pele. One day, they were all sledding down the side of this volcano, Mount Kia, on the northern side of the island. Not snow sledding, mind you, but lava sledding, which unfortunately is not as cool as it sounds. You're actually just riding a sled down the side of a grassy hill. It still looks awesome and is definitely dangerous, but not quite as much as literal lava sledding would be. Unfortunately, we're not bionicles, so I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that. Anyway, while they were enjoying the activity, the beautiful Pele showed up, introducing herself as Kia Hilele. She asks the gals if she can join them in their contest, and they say, Absolutely. Like usual, there's a few different ways the contest goes down, but in all of them, Pele ends up getting jealous of the snow goddess Poliahu's mad skills and goes on to attack her and the other three kupuas with fire and lava. Now realizing they just pissed off a very powerful fire deity, they start to run away, but Pele's temper is causing an earthquake that's about to set off the volcano they're on. Not wanting the island to be destroyed because of this hothead, the four kupuas combine their powers of snow, water, and mist to create an ice cap on top of the mountain, preventing the flow of lava and saving the day. Now that Pele's powers were effectively cut off, the Kupuas turned to the offensive and attacked her. Then she ran away back to the southern part of the island. So what's really cool about this myth is that it actually explains two natural phenomenon that exist in Hawaii. The first of which being the ice cap that exists on Mauna Kea to this day, and the second being the northern part of the island getting more ocean breeze and precipitation while the southern part gets more dry air. That second phenomenon has also been attributed to her love-hate relationship with the rain Kupua named Kamapua uh, but that's a myth for another video. Right now, I actually want to fast forward to the end of Pele's time as a kupua. See, at some point, her vengeful older sister Namaka finds out that she didn't die in their last battle and resolves to finish the job once and for all. The battle between them was epic. Lava and water were duking it out, with each side gaining the upper hand throughout the scuffle, but in the end, Namaka overpowered Pele and tore her body apart piece by piece. It was then that her soul was released from its physical husk and became one with the volcano known as Kilauea which is still active to this day. Don't feel too sorry for Pele though, she's still able to manifest a human form and walk around Hawaii Island. Usually she takes the form of a beautiful young woman or an ugly old beggar lady with a white dog. The legend says that when she's in her beggar form, she'll ask random passers-by for food, water, or shelter. If they're generous and say yes, she'll reward them, but if not, they'll suffer greatly the next time the volcano erupts. Another cool and very famous legend about Pele is that when tourists come to Hawaii and take some of the island's natural beauty, like volcanic rocks, plants, or even sand back home with them, the goddess curses them with bad luck. And you may scoff at that, but every year the National Park Service receives a plethora of natural items through the USPS from tourists asking Pele for forgiveness. Now I guess we know where the folks at Disney got the idea to have Maui steal Tafiti's heart, the resulting curse that afflicted the islands, and his apologetically returning it at the end. Or at least that's part of where they got the idea. As I mentioned earlier, they were also inspired by some myths about the goddess of death, Hina Nui Te Po, So we actually talked a little about Maui's experience with this goddess in my last Moana episode, but this time around, we've got a lot more detail. Starting with the basics, Hina Nui Te Po is the goddess of night, death, and the underworld. Roughly translated, her name means great woman of night. The goddess is described as having dark green glowing eyes, teeth as sharp as volcanic glass, a large mouth like a fish, and hair floating in the air as if she were underwater. An interesting detail about Hine is that she was born from the union of Tani Mahuda, the god of peace and beauty, and a mortal woman. Woman. But not just any mortal woman, Hini Ahu Oni, the very first mortal woman who was made from clay. Also, she had a different name when she was born, Tiki Kapa Kapa, but that soon changed to Hini Autaria. For those curious about why she changed her name a second time and became Hine Nue Te Po, there's actually a pretty sad myth about it. See, when Hine was born, she somehow didn't know that her father was her father, and when she matured, she not only married him, but bore his children. She does eventually figure out his true identity, though, and because this isn't Greco-Roman mythology, where in 
obsessed with something every god engaged in just a little bit, she was filled with shame and regret. So much so that she voluntarily descended to the underworld known as Po or Darkness to avoid showing her face, and as a result, the goddess went on to become known as Hini Nui Te Po. Fun fact, before Tefiti's enraged alter ego was named Teka, she was called Te Po. Actually, Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote a song for the movie called Unstoppable that didn't end up being used, and the lyrics refer to Te Po devouring Maui and putting an end to the Polynesians' voyages. Crazy how much storylines change throughout development, isn't it? That's just one of the ways we can connect her with the film, though. We already went over how Maui's attempt to gain immortality for humans was turned into giving them the power of creation, complete with him entering her deep and dark caverns by turning into a creepy, crawly thing. But there's another myth about two mortals' journey to the underworld that you could sort of relate to the Greek tale of Orpheus and Eurydice. So in this myth, there's a super good dart thrower named Hutu. He refuses to have sex with this upper-class woman named Pa, who's super enamored with him, and she's so heartbroken from the rejection that she hangs herself. In response, her servants capture and try to kill Hutu for what he did, which technically was nothing. I gotta say, I've not had sex a lot of times before. This is the worst ever. <laughs> the good news is he managed to escape that horrible fate by promising that he would retrieve Pa's soul from the underworld and bring her back to life. Kind of a ridiculous promise, but the servants figure he'll either succeed or die trying, so they agree. Then Hutu does the appropriate incantation to fix Pa's broken neck before traveling to the underworld. On his way there, he comes across our girl Hine and gives her a token to let him pass. And in response, she tells him how to descend into the underworld so that he'll land on his feet. Now remember the way that Maui and Moana entered Lalotai, the realm of the monsters? It's basically the same thing. You jump into a deep pit, make your way through a layer of ocean water, and if you're lucky, you'll land on your feet. If not, you'll land on your head or maybe even someone else. Well, she's dead. It's also worth mentioning that there's a deleted scene where Maui describes Lalotai as a place where monsters go after they die. And in earlier drafts of the story, it was a realm of spirits, not monsters, making it resemble the underworld that Hutu is traveling to that much more. Well, you'll be happy to hear that Hutu does manage to find Pa's soul and restores it to her body. The myth has kind of a weird ending, though, because instead of going back to his family, part of the reason he didn't want to hook up with her in the first place, he stays in the village and marries Pa. Those poor kids. I guess that's what happens when you try to get someone like a dart thrower to settle down though. Those dudes just have too many options. I think the best place to start this breakdown off would be with the origins of Tefiti, the mother island as Gramatala calls her. In my estimation, there are two Polynesian goddesses that resemble her the most, Papa Hanamoku, also known as Mother Island, and Haumea, another earth deity who's also the goddess of fertility and childbirth. Depending on where you're asking, those two goddesses may be combined into one, but we're gonna talk about them individually. First, Papa Hanamoku, or Papa, as she is thankfully called. She's basically been around since the very beginning beginning. Worshipped all across Polynesia as a primordial force of creation with the power to create life and heal, she's the wife and consort of the sky god Wakia, and they personify creative female power and creative male power, respectively. Anyone else notice the similarity with Gaia and Uranus in the Greek creation myth? Interesting how so many of these creation stories start with the union of the earth and sky. Similar to how Tefiti created the islands in the movie, in Hawaiian mythology, Papa gave birth to the islands after being impregnated by Wakia and their children went on to be known as Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, and Kauai. Giving birth to islands. That had to hurt, huh? Well, after that process was done and the islands were born, they decided to have another child and their daughter, Huoho Kukulani, was born. And get this, that's not even her full name. No, her actual name is... That, and it could be translated to she who sets the stars in heaven and adorns the celestial regions. Honestly, I think I'd rather say that every single time than even try to pronounce it the original way. Anyway, there is one particularly weird myth that their new daughter is known for, and it definitely gives off Greek mythology vibes on account of the incest. You see, as Huoho got older, her father Wakia became enchanted by her beauty, but because she was still young and because he was terrified of angering his wife Papa, he had to come up with a plan to secretly seduce her. One day, he orders a priest to take Papa on a journey to another island, and while she was gone, he had intercourse with her daughter, which led to her getting pregnant. As you'd expect, when Papa returned home and found out about this, she was furious, but all of that anger was drained away after Huoho's son was stillborn. Papa took it upon herself to name the baby Haloa, which means eternal breath, and then buried it facing the rising sun in the east. And then from the spot he was buried sprouted the taro plant, which was very important to Hawaiian diets back in the day. 
day. The story isn't over yet though. Later on, Waki and Huoho have another baby they also name Haloa, and in some regions, he's considered the first of the native Hawaiian people. So there you go, a bit more complicated than Tafiti, just rising out of the ocean and waving her hands around, but similar enough that I think they definitely could have taken inspiration from it. And to take it a step further, I want to touch on the concept of Aloha Aina, which was definitely mispronounced. It can be translated to love of the land and is a concept slash way of life that pervades many aspects of Hawaiian culture, from the spiritual to the social and even scientific. The belief is founded upon a sense of being connected to all living things, and many Hawaiians embrace it with the intention of improving the well-being of their homeland and its many children. The goddess Papa is a central figure to this movement as she's the one who is being abused by mankind, and I can't help but see a connection between this and Maui's ignorance when stealing her heart. Sounds to me like it could have been the seed the movie's final plot sprouted from. And as great of a spot as that would be to wrap this section up, we can't forget the other goddess who may have influenced the Tafiti character, and that's Haumea, the goddess of fertility and childbirth. It should be mentioned that depending on who you're asking, she and Papa may be the same goddess, which makes sense because there's some overlap in their domains and they're both some of the most ancient deities that Hawaiians worship. But when she's not being conflated with Papa, Haumea is said to be the wife of the god Kanaloa and mother of many important deities like Pele, Hiaka, and Namaka, something I want you to remember for next section. According to myths, she carries a magical stick called the makale, which attracts fish and helps produce food. It also gives her the ability to transform from a wrinkly old woman into a pretty young thing, which is useful for reproduction purposes. See, apparently, every couple hundred years or so, Hamia will return to her homeland and marry one of her children or grandchildren to create the next generation of humans. Then she'll stick around for a few more generations, which ultimately leads to them discovering her identity and her storming off in anger. Then, then after some time passes and when everyone who can identify the goddess is either dead or too old to remember, she'll come back as her younger self and the cycle repeats. As you can see, that myth is also a bit more complicated than what we're told in Moana. And there's actually one more story that explains the important role Hamia had in human reproduction. One day, the goddess overhears the daughter of a famous Hawaiian chief crying out in pain while in labor. And after checking in on her, she discovers the only way humans gave birth was by cutting open the stomach of the mother, like a C-section. The goddess proceeded to make the chief's daughter a pain potion out of flowers from the Kani Kaui tree. And after drinking it, she was able to push the baby out. And ever since then, that's primarily how humans have given birth. So that was the mythology behind the Polynesian goddesses who inspired Tafiti. But our work is not done yet. So if you watched my last Moana episode where I explained how Pele, the volcano goddess, was the inspiration for Teka, then you should remember me mentioning her sister Namaka, goddess of the ocean, and considered to be her polar opposite. We talked about how Pele and Namaka never got along due to them embodying conflicting elements and how Pele slept with Namaka's husband. This led to the sea goddess hunting her sister down and beating her half to death multiple times, and as a consequence of lava and water combining during their battles, the Hawaiian islands grew in size. I am sad to say that's pretty much the only myth that Namaka is known for, and there isn't much, if any, mythology about her that I didn't already cover in the last episode, but while researching for this one, I found myself on a fascinating train of thought. See, originally, when I started writing this video, I was under the impression that Namaka was the inspiration for Tafiti, because the two were opposites of Pele and Teka, respectively. But as you can tell from the previous section, I no longer believe that to be true. Now I think that the ocean spirit who guides Moana to her destiny was Namaka, and if you're willing to hear me out, I want to make my case. That's right, we're getting back into the old cartoon conspiracy theories today. So for starters, there's the obvious connection to the water. If Namaka, or a Disney-fied version of her, does exist in Moana's universe, then she's no doubt responsible for the ocean's behavior, which means she's the one who chose Moana to return to Fiti's heart. But then that leaves us with the question, why would she get involved? Well, judging from the movie's epic final battle, I get the vibe that, just like in the mythos, the volcano goddess doesn't really get along with the ocean ocean goddess. I mean, because of their very nature, she can't even touch her without feeling extreme pain. On top of that, Papa, the goddess that inspired Tafiti, is often combined with Haumea, the mother of Namaka and Pele. So what if, in Moana's universe, Tafiti is the mother of the ocean spirit, and when the ocean saw that its mother was being taken over by this vengeful, destructive being, she was motivated to help? Now, some of you might point out that Tafiti's heart was initially lost in the ocean, and if it really wanted to help, it could have just returned it to her. If the ocean so smart. Why didn't it just take the heart back to Tafiti itself? 
The ocean straight up kooky dukes. But remember, the ocean is fundamentally incompatible with her fiery alter ego. If she didn't have somebody else deliver the goods, Teika could have become so angered by Namaka's possession of her heart, who knows what her reaction would have been. She could have tossed it aside as a way of saying, I don't need your help, or been so infuriated that her rival had it that she took her vengeance out on the humans her heart was stolen for with an eruption that blocked out the sun. I think that Namaka knew the safest way to restore peace to her mother's soul would be if the original thief and his would-be benefactor returned it themselves and a Apologized, and since Moana was the most capable for the journey, she was chosen. Now, to be clear, this is just a theory I came up with when I was originally researching for this episode, and as cool as it would have been to see it incorporated, it looks like Disney has taken the plot in a new direction for Moana 2. I mean, it's somewhat new. From what I've seen in the trailers, it looks like the writers decided to recycle the whole cursed homeland angle from the first movie for some reason. Hopefully, the rest of the story is fresh and new because I want to see them incorporate more Polynesian deities and myths. But honestly, I have my doubts about Disney's ability to deliver on anything audiences want nowadays. Regardless, I think the majority of viewers would be ecstatic to see more beautifully animated characters from that culture. Speaking of, there is one more character I want to talk about before we wrap this episode up, and that's Moana herself. So for the most part, Moana is a completely original character. No god or goddess has served as direct inspiration for her creation. That being said, there's another water goddess named Moana Nui Kalahua who has her own interaction with Maui that I think may traumatize some of our younger viewers. I don't want to hype it up too much, but if you thought it was mean for Maui to throw her off the boat or Moana to stick a blow dart in his butt cheek, you may be better off skipping this part. So Moana Nui Kalahua, or as I like to call her, Moana, was a Polynesian water goddess who appeared as a fish or mermaid, depending on the telling, and was responsible for guarding the Kai'i channel between the Kauai and Oahu Islands. One day, she catches Maui fishing in her waters, which she does not appreciate at all, and because like Maui, she's a bit of a troublemaker, she decides to play a prank on him by taking his magical fishing hook and sticking it into a submerged rock. Well, after Maui realized what happened, he was furious and not one to be outpranked, pursued Moana in revenge. After catching up to the goddess, he grabs her by the tail and pulls her onto the shore, where she slowly but surely suffocates and dies. That's right, in the original myth, Maui kills Moana. Well, she's dead. And honestly, I think we should be allowed to deal with TikTok pranksters in the same way. The part I find funny about this, though, is that despite murdering her in a way that had to be just miserable, he did still respect her along with the other gods, so he built the shrine in her honor and buried her. Moana's spirit was then transformed, and from the spot she was buried sprouted the Olia Lahua, which is one of Hawaii's most sacred trees. You know, word on the street is there were nine different versions of the Moana script before it was finalized, and I can't help but wonder if any of them ended like this. I mean, obviously, not, but the idea of having something so savage animated by the geniuses in Disney Studio sounds so awesome to me. I'm low-key still holding out hope that they'll buy the Mortal Kombat franchise. I mean, Kano was in Wreck-It Ralph, so my dreams aren't dead yet. So now you know everything there is to know about the messed up origins of Moana. And as you can see, I was not lying in the intro. Seeing these myths in their original form on the big screen definitely would have traumatized the kids watching it. And for that reason, I will always be impressed by Musker, Clements, and the rest of the team at Disney who managed to respect the mythology while also making it family friendly. I guess they had some good practice with Hercules though, didn't they? I am curious to see what's in store for Moana 2 though, and I want to hear your thoughts on that and everything we covered today. Do you plan on watching Moana 2 when it releases in theaters? And are you going to see certain characters differently now that you know about the source material? Let me know in a comment, then make sure to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons so you don't miss our upcoming deep dive into the new characters introduced in Moana 2. Until next week, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.